For many centuries, London was a dangerous place. It was a magnet for the very worst kind of people. Jack the Ripper dominated the headlines. But he wasn't the only killer around. Murder was afoot. The fear of death was everywhere. But police had their work cut out to track the culprits down. In this series, we'll be investigating some of the country's most notorious and intriguing crimes. The female defendant. Sexual intrigue. Vicious murder. As well as the latest technology fed the nation's insatiable desire for gruesome stories of London's dark side. He was a small-time crook. That's what police thought at first. A scheme seemed to lurk behind his quick smile and sharp suits. And he had a reputation. Despite the rationing which still lingered in Britain years after the Second World War, John George Haig was a man who could get you anything. But nobody knew the truth which lay behind his extravagant lifestyle. When police investigating the disappearance of an elderly widow in February 1949 brought Haig in for questioning, they had no idea of the story they were about to uncover. Apologies for keeping you waiting. Mr. Haig? Please, do call me John. Are you no Inspector Webb? Oh, yes. Old friends by now. Just a few more questions for you, John. Of course. Anything I can do to help. I was just telling Inspector Symes that uh, you're a, a businessman. Hurst Lee Products Limited, director and chief engineer. Oh, well, that must take you all around the country to work like that. Oh, I get about on my rounds, yes. It's a lovely looking motor car, that Alvis of yours. Isn't she a beauty? Do you ever get to Horsham on your rounds, Mr. Haig? Horsham? Yes, a fair bit, actually. Or I used to, at any rate. Not so much recently. No? Well, when was the last time you were there? It must be months. The pictures, one evening. Oh, I see. Not the only time, John. Are you sure? Yes. As far as I recall. The thing is, Mr. Haig, I know that you have been to Horsham much more recently than that. We know that uh, you have visited the jewellers on Middle Street on no fewer than four occasions in the last ten days. You 
you sold them all this. They're Mrs. Duran Deacons, aren't they? During the police investigation into the disappearance of Olive Duran Deacon, a jeweler had identified Haig as the man who had sold him her jewelry. There was now a direct link between Haig and the missing woman. He was no longer aiding the police in their investigation. He was now their prime suspect. Haig knew his devilish scheme was at an end. It's time to tell us what happened, John. I was wondering if you had those when we first started. I'm afraid it is a rather long story. John George Haig was born in Lincolnshire on the 24th of July, 1909. He was the only child of deeply religious working-class parents. The family were members of the Plymouth Brethren, a minority non-conformist group who believed they were a chosen people, superior to others. I think the family background might give us the first clue as to John Haig's future. The only book in the house was the Bible. Newspapers were banned, and in fact, it went as far as John's school friends not being encouraged to come back to the house. It was pretty isolated. Haig's a very complex character to explain as a child. He excelled in maths and chemistry and in draftsmanship. He was a very musical child. He was actually given a scholarship uh, to join Wakefield Cathedral. He sang in the choir and played the organ in the cathedral. But he did seem to have got a real great talent for telling lies and getting away with it. He also had a very sadistic streak. At an early age, he decided for himself that there really was nothing in religion. He was the master of his own ends. And maybe due to the fact that he had the superiority that it felt coming down the family line, he would bully people. There was always this thing that the world was an evil place. And later on, he said he used to have these dreams where trees would turn into crucifixes and, and there'd be the, the dripping of blood. And this was all part of the background that he built up later on. Haig's upbringing was strict, but not unloving. There were few signs in childhood of his later criminality, but almost as soon as he left school, he began the life of a petty crook and swindler. It's insurance scams, embezzlement, fraud, petty thieving. That's going to be the pattern for the rest of his life, broken up by various spells of imprisonment. He got convicted of fraud because he was involved with higher purchase deals. It was non-existent customers and non-existent cars. He also got involved in another fraud, which was to do with selling fictitious shares in companies. His draftsmanship skills were immense. Many people thought he was one of the best forgers Britain ever had. He could copy someone's handwriting without any fluctuation. He was a great con man. He'd spend hours practicing in front of a mirror doing different facial expressions. Classic psychopathic thing, really, to, to look into a mirror and actually take on that chameleon look of having a total facade of your expression. Money was always the motive behind Haig's crimes. He longed for a lifestyle legitimate employment could not give him. By 1949, he had advanced to more serious crimes. In 
By this time, Haig was living in London. There he resided at the Onslow Court Hotel in South Kensington. He was a rare, younger bachelor. Most of the residents in the upmarket establishment were elderly women. But Haig was a man who always enjoyed feeling special. Among the other residents was a wealthy widow named Olive Durand Deacon. Haig paid particular attention to the 68-year-old. He charmed the older woman, steadily worming his way into her confidence over meals in the dining room. It was there that Mrs. Durand Deacon must have told Haig about her business idea for artificial fingernails. Haig styled himself an engineer and entrepreneur. He told her his company was interested and invited her to his workshop in Crawley. So after lunch on the 18th of February, Mrs. Durand Deacon in her black Persian lamb coat met Haig at the hotel reception. They traveled down to the workshop together in his motor car. She did not return to the Onslow Court Hotel that evening, nor was she seen the next morning at breakfast. Here we are. How exciting. Oh. Welcome to Hearst Leaf Products Limited. It's very practical. Some of my most profitable ventures began here. Well, from small acorns. Great oaks do grow. Oh. Yes, I suppose they do. Shall we have a look at some of our little acorns? The prototypes. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, the, the prototypes. What am I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Just straight ahead. Now, these are just to give you an idea. Your designs, of course, will be much more attractive. The colour is very cheery, but the material, John... What is it you've done? I'm afraid it will sound all too fantastic for belief. The sudden disappearance of Olive Durand Deacon caused alarm. Fellow resident Constance Lane was particularly worried. Mrs. Durand Deacon was a woman of regular habits. Disappearing like this just wasn't her style. Haig echoed Mrs. Lane's concerns. He insisted that Mrs. Durand Deacon had not, in fact, kept her appointment with him. He had not seen her, he said, since Friday morning. By Sunday, there was still no sign of the missing woman. Haig and Mrs. Lane went to the police with their worries. An investigation was opened. Police suspicion soon turned on Haig. His workshop in Crawley was searched. On the floor, packed with straw, were several large chemical containers. They were empty. In a briefcase, police found a gun, along with passports and ration cards in names they did not recognize. Tucked among the papers and an envelope of ammunition was one other thing, a receipt from a firm of cleaners in Reigate. It was for a woman's black Persian lamb coat. Mrs. Duran Deacon no longer exists. She has disappeared. I have destroyed her with acid. <laughs> 
You should see your face, Inspector. <laughs> Isn't he a sight? <laughs> you are saying that you have disposed of Mrs. Durand Deacon with acid. Sulfuric acid, yes. You will find the sludge that remains outside my workshop on Leopold Road. Haig hoisted the body of Olive Durand Deacon into a large drum, which he then filled with sulfuric acid. Within a few days, all that remained of Mrs. Durand Deacon was a fatty sludge and plastic handbag which had resisted corrosion. Haig disposed of it all in the yard outside his workshop. He bent the body in half and pushed her bottom first into the oil drum. That's when he pumped in the sulfuric acid. He got rid of the jewelry and the furs and got money for those. He went to a nearby pub, had lunch, and went back and he started continuing to, to destroy the body. He tried to make sure he dissolved her in, in these wretched drums and after about 48 hours he more or less achieved that. But he had no drain to put down the remains so he just sloshed everything in the backyard, but there was a lot of junk and mess, and he thought, well, if I tip it out there, it'll never be noticed. He tipped out the contents of the oil drum on the waste ground at the side, and there were still parts of her that hadn't been destroyed. Her dentures weren't affected by the sulfuric acid. There were bone fragments, particularly uh, one of her heels was left. And most crucially of all, Olive Duran Deacon had gallstones. He tipped these stones out, put them on the waste ground, not really realising that to a pathologist, school stones look very different to small pebbles. Possibly had they been left in the acid for long enough, they might have disappeared completely. But the fact that this was tipped out of the barrel may have contributed to them um, surviving intact. It's quite a simple process, really. Once you've mastered it, at any rate. What do you mean? Well, that's how I disposed of the others too, you see. What others? Haig's first victim was William McSwan. They first met in 1937. Haig was employed briefly as William's chauffeur and seemed to thrive in the work. But of course, it could not support his more extravagant tastes. His expensive cars, tailored suits, and relentless gambling were soon funded instead through criminal endeavor. Those led to prison. But Haig was not forgotten by his one-time employer. William visited him behind bars, and the pair would meet for drinks after Haig's release. On the 9th of September, 1944, the friends met at the Goat Pub on Kensington High Street, as they had several times before. William had no idea of what Haig had planned for him this time, however. From the Goat, I took Mac back to Gloucester Road. I had a basement flat there, number 79, opposite the tube. The moment I closed the door behind us, I gave him a little tap on the head with a cosh. They say it's difficult to kill someone, don't they? But people are such dimwits. It's as easy a thing as falling off a log. Mac was dead within five minutes or so. It's the bodies. That's why you have to be clever. That's where a gentleman shows his real skill. So, you dissolved Mr. McSwan in acid. 
Exactly as I did, Mrs. Duran Deacon, yes. Though I was quite the amateur that first time. I didn't even have a mask, would you believe? Well, I nearly choked on the fumes. Well, that would have been unfortunate. I had to keep going for fresh air. In, out, in, out. So once the body had uh, dissolved, what did you do then? There was a drain in the basement. A jolly handy thing, too. It all washed straight into the river. The petty crimes of John George Haig had escalated. In a few years, he had gone from fraud and minor offenses to the most heinous misdemeanor, murder. His friend and work colleague, William McSwan, was his first victim. But Haig, unlike most killers, had devised a foolproof way of dispatching his victims. Or so he thought. With the body of William McSwan disposed of, the only loose end was William's parents, Donald and Amy. Haig told them their son had gone on the run to avoid conscription into the army. They had every reason to believe him. After all, when the Second World War began, William had registered as a conscientious objector, and he had lived in constant fear of being called up. Haig had graduated from petty criminal to murderer. The motive behind his crimes remained the same, however. Haig emptied William's bank account and sold what valuables he found on the body. But the money would not last forever. Nor would the war. By this time, Allied victory over Germany was certain. It was just a question of when. Of course, when the war ended, there would be no reason for William McSwan to hide. With funds running low and the excuse for William's absence disappearing, Haig turned his attention to the parents. I don't think the, the monetary reward was huge from his first victim. He did start taking money out of McSwan's bank account, but that was limited because a lot of the business side of McSwan's business that was actually uh, with his parents. So I think he got so far with it and then uh, decided probably if he was going to pursue this line, then it may have to be um, McSwan's parents. Early in 1945, he bought 30 gallons of sulfuric acid. All he had to do then was lure the couple to the flat in Gloucester Road. On Monday, the 2nd of July, 1945, Haig brought first the 67-year-old Donald, then the 62-year-old Amy, to the basement flat. One after another, he battered them to death before placing them, like their son, in a vat of acid. Neither of them had any apprehension of what was to happen. I made sure of that. They felt no fear. I see. So, after you beat them to death, I take it dissolving their bodies in acid was your next act of kindness? I am not a cruel man, Inspector. I was never cruel to any of them. Just answer the question, John. I am a very kind person. I often go out of my way for others. And it's very rarely reciprocated, I might add. So, what did you do next? You, you put them in a tank of acid? Separate tanks, yes. And how long does this take, the, the process? It depends on their size and build, the water content of their bodies, that sort of thing. 
It generates a tremendous amount of heat. Did you know that? No, no, I did not. The chemical reaction. It's quite an extraordinary thing to watch. He was a charmer, he was articulate, he, he could just about persuade them of anything. So he dealt with the parents in exactly the same way as he'd dealt with the son, take them up one by one to the basement, hit them on the back of the head and uh, dissolve the bodies in acid. By now he had realized that he couldn't dispose of the bodies by not protecting himself. And this is when he'd already got hold of thick gloves, rubber boots, thick rubber apron and of course was wearing a gas mask. This is what we come now to see as, as the quintessential image of the acid bath killer in practice. After the McSwans had been killed, he went to a solicitor's office posing as the son and gained power of attorney over the properties and over their finances. Altogether, he made roughly about eight, eight to nine thousand pounds. He actually signed the paperwork in the presence of witnesses uh, and amazingly got away with it all. Haig felt unstoppable. He thought he had devised the perfect method of murder, for if there was no body, who could say there had ever been a crime? He was so clever so cunning. It was only a shame he couldn't boast about it. With the proceeds of his crimes, Haig bought a flash new car and gambled recklessly with bookmakers across London. He soon burned through the money. I was rather pinched for cash, but that is the life of the businessman, the entrepreneur, ups and downs. Most can't cope with it, but it's all part of the thrill. Anyway, it was during one of those down months I met the Hendersons. They were the next ones. Archie, Dr. Henderson, his wife was Rosalie, second wife, decade younger. They had a hell of a marriage. The things she told me. So, when was this exactly? You, you said uh, 1947? Summer. Late summer. Do say if I'm going too fast for you, Inspector. No, 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 go on. They were interesting people. Amusing. Fond of expensive parties. Or oh, they had this lovely dog, this little red setter called Pat. He was a dear thing. Blind, it turned out. How was it that you met them, the Hendersons? It was a stroke of luck, really. I answered an ad in the paper. They had this place up for sale in Ladbroke Square, and I expressed an interest. Haig offered to buy the property for 10 and a half thousand pounds. He had just 26 pounds, however, in his bank account. The introduction was just what he wanted. Like Haig, Archibald and Rosalie Henderson had extravagant tastes. Unlike him, they could more easily afford it. Their marriage was an unstable one, however. Archibald was a drunk, and Rosalie was a hypochondriac. The way he got friendly with them was through music, because of his piano playing, the organ playing, and it was his love of music which brought the three of them together. He ingratiated himself into their lives, they were great socialites. They were wealthy and loved parties. He fitted the park completely with his smart suits and he would walk their dog, Pat. And so it was quite easy to enter the Henderson's way of life. It became clear after a while that although he said he wanted the house, he really wasn't going to buy it. He admitted to me and he didn't have the money for it. But by that time, he ingratiated himself so far into the family. The one thing about this is that Archie himself, when he got drunk, he had a bit of a temper on him. And he thought, rightly or wrongly, that Haig was trying to move in on his wife. 
Haig was actually setting all this up. He was deliberately trying to draw a wedge between them uh, as all part of his long-standing scheme uh, to give himself an excuse, a story for when he killed them later on. It was in Haig's workshop in Leopold Road in Crawley that Olive Duran Deacon would be murdered in cold blood. But the previous year, it was where he had lured Mr. and Mrs. Henderson. I took Dr. Henderson to the workshop first. I shot him in the head. With the weapon that we recovered from Leopold Road? The Enfield Service Revolver, that's right. He was in the army, or the medical corps, at any rate. So it was his gun? I took it from their house. So you walk into the workshop and you shoot Dr. Henderson in the head? Yes. I then put him in a tank, of course, and went to fetch Rosalie. I told her Archie had been taken ill, that it was an emergency. I then shot her in the head as well. Haig dumped the dissolved remains of the couple in the yard outside. He then sent letters to their friends and family, impersonating the couple and saying they'd gone overseas. Once again, he forged deeds of transfer for their property and took money from their tenants. This time, however, his victims were missed. They were socialites, they had relatives, and they had friends. He still managed that by saying that there'd been a few money troubles and that they had taken off for South Africa. The person that was hardest to convince about this was uh, Arnold Berlin. Rose Henderson's brother was very, very suspicious and wanted to know what was happening. And Haig said Dr. Henderson had committed an illegal abortion and there was a danger of him being arrested. That was the cover story. There are some amazing letters forged by Haig to Berlin, written as from Rose mostly, copying her handwriting and uh, suggesting that Haig has been such a wonderful friend, you know, do look after him, but we're off to South Africa. Everything is just fine, you know. Rose's brother got particularly concerned when a letter supposedly came from the Hendersons saying that they owed Haig two and a half thousand pounds and if it wasn't paid within a, a couple of months then their car and their house was due to be given to him in lieu of payment. This sounded very suspicious. Arnold was not convinced by the letters and telegrams he received. He came to London to search but his suspicions never landed on Haig, even when Arnold spotted his sister's address book in the man's car. Haig just seemed too helpful, too nice, too plausible. Arnold eventually gave up. Haig's narrow escape only made him more reckless. Haig began 1948 with more than 7,000 pounds in his bank account. That's over a quarter of a million in today's money. But by early 1949, he was in debt again with his bank. He owed money to countless bookmakers and was well behind in rent at the Onzo Court Hotel. Haig was confident he would find a solution, however. Many of his fellow residents at the Onslow Court Hotel were wealthy women, after all. Mrs. Duran Deacon, the widow from room 115, was not the first resident Haig targeted, but she was the first who agreed to accompany him to Crawley and his dank workshop there. John, Over a period of five years, Haig killed them all before dissolving their bodies in acid. Several of the victims were Haig's friends, but that was no protection for them. Haig's only interest was in the money he could earn from them. There were means to an end. Their ends became his means. Haig thought he was better than other people, and certainly cleverer than the police interviewing him. He may have confessed to the killings, but he had no intention 
of hanging for them. Would you like a magazine? No, I'm quite all right. I don't know how long it'll be. What is dear Inspector Symes up to? Well, John, like all of us, he's working very hard to get you hanged. But what on earth for? What's the one thing we hang men for in this country? But you can't prove anything. There's no body. We don't need a body to prove murder. Yes. You do. Trust me, we don't. They don't hang insane men, do they? You're not insane, John. But what if a man is found guilty of murder? But the jury is convinced that he's insane. Then they send him to Broadmoor, to the Asylum for Criminal Lunatics. Does anyone ever get out? The legal definition of insanity to reduce a murder charge is that you have to be incapable of a criminal intent to actually commit that crime, and it's quite a strong test. The person is insane, it's because they are of brute nature or have an infant's nature and don't know what they are doing is wrong. It's quite as simple as that. So it's not until the 19th century you get this uh, formulation. Claiming insanity was Haig's last throw of the dice. If he could convince everyone he was not in sound mind, he may just escape execution. That's the lot, is it? William McSwan, his parents, Donald and Amy, the Hendersons, Mrs. Durand Deacon. Is there nothing else you want to tell us? There was one other thing. I drank their blood. You what? After I killed them, I made an incision in their necks, drained their blood, and then I drank it. Haig's trial began on the 18th of July, 1949. Charged with the murder of Mrs. Durand Deacon, he pleaded not guilty. But his defense would not deny that Haig had committed the murders. Instead, they would argue that he was insane and an asylum should be his destination rather than the gallows. The case would turn on one question. Did Haig meet the legal definition of insanity? His destiny would be shaped by an obscure case from over a century earlier. Daniel McNaughton was a Scottish woodturner. In 1843, he attempted to assassinate Robert Peel, the British Prime Minister. On the afternoon of the 20th of January, he waited near Downing Street until he spotted his target. McNaughton then walked up behind him, drew a pistol and fired at point-blank range. But McNaughton had been mistaken. It was not the Prime Minister he shot, but a civil servant named Edward Drummond. Drummond died five days later, and McNaughton was put on trial for murder but he escaped the death penalty. His defense convinced the court that McNaughton was suffering from delusions. 
he was cleared. The verdict provoked outrage in Britain. Judges were summoned by the House of Lords to explain the decision. Their answers would define the law on insanity for the next century and more. The judges told the House of Lords that a defendant could claim insanity if they satisfied one of two criteria. Either the defendant did not know what they were doing, or if they did know what they were doing, they did not know it was wrong. The judges' answers became known as the McNaughton Rules. I dare say that there were some people who were convicted of murder and perhaps hanged when they might have been mentally disordered. The McNaughton Rules did actually kind of establish a proper legal judgment and precedent of this day. That was the basis of Hague's defense, the McNaughton Rules, which of course still operate today. In fact, they operate in very, very many countries. That is still the basic rule. His defense, Sir David Maxwell Fife, offered little cross-examination. All would rest on the evidence of their own witness, Dr. Henry Yellowlees. Yellowlees was one of three psychiatrists who had examined Haig on behalf of the defense. But he was the only one who thought him potentially insane. According to Yellowlees, Haig suffered from paranoia and delusions of serving some higher power. Dr. Yellowlees took a long time going through all the psychiatric evidence and said in his view, Haid was paranoid. But the only thing he was not prepared to say is whether Haig knew or not whether he was doing something legally wrong. Nobody was fooled by these claims of drinking blood and forests of crucifixes and things like that. It had clearly been a ploy by Haig, who was a clever man, to convince them other than the truth. The prosecution were quick to remind the court that Haig had planned the killings, destroyed evidence, and profited from the assets of the dead. He knew what he was doing. The jury agreed. Fittingly, for a man whose lofty opinion of himself was never backed up by actual achievement, Haig's last scheme failed. He was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. At Wandsworth Prison in London on the 10th of August, 1949, John George Haig was hanged. He was buried within the prison grounds. There was a body and a grave for the acid bath murderer, more than he'd ever granted his victims.